sine of 3x plus 10, this whole thing to the sixth power, so I'm assuming it looks, you know, the standard, the crazy notation that we've reserved for sine is that this is the sixth power. Um, and then we have two cosine cubed of 6x minus 20. And what we are curious about is what is the period of this function? Uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. The, it, it's certainly true that the period is going to be measured in, a, in either so, some units of angle, for sure, uh, but you can convert from one to the other. Uh, I, I typically prefer to use radians when I can, but it's not um, critical. So the key fact, of course, that I think you probably know uh, is the following. Um, if you have something like sine, the period, if you have something like the period of sine of omega x or cosine omega x, the period of these things, so o omega is very frequently used. I'll tell you why. It's because omega in physics is sometimes called angular velocity or angular speed. Um, and it has something to do with how quickly um, we go through a single period or a single wavelength of these oscillating functions. The period of sine of omega x, I think with a little bit of thought, you'll realize that the period is going to be 2 pi over omega, right? So that the higher, the, the, the larger the value of omega, the smaller the value of 2 pi over omega. And what you then see are faster and faster oscillations of um, uh, the sine and the cosine as omega goes up. All right, so now in looking at this guy here, um, we might notice, well, there's a couple of things to notice, I guess. I think these powers really throw a wrench into the, into the works. Um, because notice that, for example, we're raising this thing to the sixth power. Um, let's see, how can I say it? Give me one moment just to think about this. Um, so I think, that okay, first point that we can make that's pretty easy to understand. Adding 10 or subtracting 20, like in the manner that's being done inside of here, is not going to have any effect on the period. What the effect of those quantities there is going to do is to shift the graphs of each of these respective waves. It's going to shift them either left or right, okay? And then of course, that's not going to have any effect on the period. However, I do think that raising these uh, trig functions to a power, I do think that that will, that will have an effect on the period that we need to be mindful of. So for example, if you think about sine squared of x, so yeah, what's the, what's the period of sine squared of x? I don't think that it's 2 pi. The reason that I don't think so is, that, is because there's something called uh, power of reduction formulas. Yeah, exactly. So I think that for this even power of sine, there, there. So there is a, um, there is a trig identity that maybe you don't know off the top of your head, but it's the truth that sine squared of x is equal to one half one minus cosine two x. So the virtue of this identity is that it reduces the power of uh, the sine to, uh, well, the sine becomes a cosine, sure, but it reduces the power. And I think you'll agree that the period of this function right here is pi and not two pi. So I think that that means that the period of this guy here, absent the three, would be pi, 
but then when you include the three, the period of this guy here would be pi over three. Um, and I think that the period of this guy, frankly, is also pi over 3. I think that this is also pi over 3 periodic. And so, and that's because we're raising this cosine to an odd power. And I believe that when you raise the cosine to an odd power, or a sine for that matter, to an odd power, that the um, period is untouched. I don't want you to think that, though. Um, for example, hmm. let's just think for a second about sine to the fourth. Here, so, because I don't know the general rules, I don't have it stored in my head. I have to rethink these things. So, what's the period of, let's say, sine to the fourth of x? Is it really pi, like we're thinking? I, I seriously wonder because. If we take sine to the fourth of x, well, on the one hand, this is sine squared squared, right? And we just got done saying that sine squared is 1 half 1 minus cosine 2x. And this whole thing gets squared. So then if we square this, we get 1 fourth times, now I have to square this. So I get 1 minus 2 cosine 2x, that's square. No, 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 that's just left alone. Plus cosine squared of 2x, right? But now we can use a, another trig identity. Another trig identity. Uh, here's another one. It's, it's sort of the partner to this one called cosine squared of x equals 1 half 1 plus cosine 2x. 1 plus. The difference is the minus here and the plus there. These are sometimes called double angle identities. And if we use that here, remember that instead of x, uh, so I, I want to apply it to the cosine squared 2x. So I'm going to replace this x here by 2x. So then this becomes cosine 4x. You agree? So that this becomes in the end, 1 fourth, 1 minus 2 cosine 2x plus 1 half, 1 plus cosine 4x. I don't have enough room. And the problem now is that, well, this has period pi, sure. But what's the period of this piece right here? This one is pi over 2 now. We want to find the integral from pi over 6 to pi over 3 of sine 2x minus cosine 2x. Uh, dx. And so, of course, what we're going to use is the fundamental theorem of calculus, right? Uh, which requires that we find some antiderivative of this integrand and then we all we need to do after that is plug in uh, the bounds of integration okay so can you tell me an antiderivative of for example sine 2x so you should know that finding an antiderivative of a sum of things or a difference of things for that matter uh, we can find an antiderivative of each of the pieces and then subtract so first Let's take first things first. What's an antiderivative for sine 2x? That is to say, what is a function whose derivative is sine 2x? Any idea? Oh, can you type bang leave? Maybe that works. Type exclamation point leave. Okay, there we go. Just wanted to test it, huh? You were skeptical that it would work. I appreciate that skepticism. 
Oh, uh, you did use substitution. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so good. I'm not, you're absolutely right in doing that. But what I want to say is that from my perspective, and I hope a place where you will be eventually in the future is that you will be able to see the antiderivatives of stuff like this without having to resort to u substitution. It'll just occur to you, but that takes practice. Okay. So let's do, let's do u substitution as you've suggested. What did you like? What did you let you be? What did you let you be? Yeah. Okay. So you let u equal two x, and then as just as you say, du is equal to two uh, dx. Now the problem with this with this whole scheme is that we don't quite see 2dx, do we? We merely see dx. We sure do wish, though, that there was a 2 in front of that dx. Don't you agree? Because if we did see that 2, then we could write 2dx as du, and that would be nice. Sure would be nice if we could do that. Don't you agree? So you know what we're going to do? We are going to force it to appear. We are going, uh, we're going to force it to appear. Uh, we are going to force it to appear. Okay. We are going to put a two right here. Just force it. You see what I did? I just put it there. But now we're going to compensate for that two with a one half. Okay. So in some total, what we've done is multiply this integral by a fancy version of one. Are you with me, Bull? This is a super useful trick. You're going to use it all the time in your life. And I want to warn you, you can only do this with constants. So for example, if you wanted to see 2x, it would be incorrect to multiply the inside of the integral by 2x and compensate with a 1 over 2x outside. Don't go crazy. You're only allowed to do this, this move, which is awesome, when you're working with constants. Remedy, how do you know when to do stuff like this? Well, we wish we saw 2dx, but we're only missing a constant, multiplicative constant 2. So we know, because we know this trick, and we've used it a lot, we know that we can force the situation to happen like this. It happened that, and this arises a lot whenever du in our substitution ends up being a constant multiple of dx. Okay, it's good. So now we are prepared. That does help people. For some reason, I hate that, but there's something about my aesthetic judgment around these things that is uh, fucked up. I know that because I know lots of students love to do that. So what we're going to do is this part right here, okay, that's going to become our du. You see, this is du. And then we can rewrite these other bits in terms of u. So what we get is one half, that's that one half integral of sine of u minus cosine of u du are we comfortable <clears throat> now there's one more thing to say about this that's very very important and you need to be aware of it and this is another thing students like to do what negative this negative You are only allowed to take out constant multiples of your uh, of your integrand. So you could, if you wanted to, factor out a negative one from this entire integrand and then pull it outside the integral if you wanted to. You could do that. 
It's not like anybody would um, get mad, except that it's really not necessary to do that or productive to do that. Reason being that you would have another negative sign here. Wait, wait, wait. Are you taking a derivative, an antiderivative there, Bolte? Because I, I need to slow you down. I need to slow you down because we need to talk about the bounds of integration. Hi, Cootie Juice 69. Hi, 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 hi. So this is important, okay? Whenever you do substitution to a definite integral, you must adjust the bounds. The, the bounds must be adjusted to reflect this substitution. What do I mean? I mean that really when we write pi over six here and pi over three, really what we're doing is establishing values for x. x is equal to pi over six and x is equal to pi over three. But of course, it's not useful to have bounds on x when uh, in our new integral, when we've done the substitution that sort of gotten rid of x from our field of view. See, we see no x's there. So what we would like to do is adjust these bounds of integration, rewrite them in terms of the new variable u. So in particular, if x is equal to pi over 6, what is the value of u? Well, we can take x equal to pi over 6 and stick it into this expression here, and we see that u is equal to 2 times pi over 6. 2 times pi over 6, a synonym for that is pi over 3. Does that make sense to you? I can say it again. Yes, exactly. You got it. Good. And now we're going to use the fundamental theorem of calculus uh, to evaluate this in a straightforward way. So now I'm going to, the fundamental theorem of calculus, F T O C. Now what we're going to do is take an antiderivative of this integrand. Can you tell me what an antiderivative of this is? Hi, Stephyrus, Stephyrus. What's an antiderivative of sine u minus cosine u? Negative cosine u minus sine u. Yeah, that's right. Good. And don't forget about the one half out here. So we're going to have one half negative cosine u minus sine u. And we're going to evaluate this. This is the notation that is often used. I hope you're comfortable with it. From pi over 3 to 2 pi over 3. Have you seen this notation before? Now, sometimes people get weird and they decide, oh, I've done my integrating in terms of u. I'm going to go back to x now. Uh, but that is so ridiculously ridiculous. Just do, just stay in, in you. St stay working with you, please. Okay. We can st shove in two pi over three and we can shove in pi over three and we win. In other words, this is equal to, of course, one half negative cosine of 2 pi over 3 minus sine of 2 pi over 3. And then we subtract from this what we get by shoving in pi over 3. So I like to, to make sure that I'm keeping track of my negative signs, right? And they're 
whole shitload of negative signs here. We have minus cosine of pi over 3 minus sine of pi over 3. And then I need to close one more time. And now this is an arithmetic problem. Okay. Do you feel like you can handle it from here or uh, should we talk more about these values? Because the calculus is done. Calculus is cooked. Now this is arithmetic, which is, the, uh, honest to goodness, the hardest part of the problem. But hopefully you can handle it. No? Is it one half? Um... So what's cosine of pi over three? That's one half, that's one half. I think the other ones, I think the answer is one half, yeah. Yeah, I think this ends up being one half. Good job. Because I think that these two guys get married and become a one, and these two guys kill each other because they're equal but have opposite signs. So it should be one half, or, oh no, 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 should it be negative one half? No, this is negative, excuse me. Yeah, this is one half. Good. Yep, all right, uh, next, who's next? If A divides C and B divides C, and GCD of A comma B is equal to D, prove A, B divides C, D. Um, so I'm thinking about, um, do you know something called, actually, I don't even remember what it's called, but do you know the following fact? that if you have the GCD of two numbers, like you can kind of express the GCD of two numbers. So uh, here's the statement. For all um, A and B in Z, you uh, GCD of A comma B, whatever it is, can be expressed as um, like M times A plus N times B for some integers, M and N. Yeah, exactly. Bezu identity, yeah, Bez Bezu's identity. Yeah, that's exactly right. So I'm wondering if that helps here. So um, this we're calling D. So this is D and this is M A plus N B for some M and N. And um, let's see, we wanna show that AB divides CD. So A, well, of course we need to use the fact that A divides C and B divides C. So the fact that A divides C, for example, The fact that a divides c means that we can write c as some integer k times a, right? And similarly, the fact that b divides c means that we can write, I guess, c as some other integer j times b. I'm not sure we need all of this, but let's just see. So what we're going to do is write this, uh, take this equation and multiply both sides by C maybe? I'm not sure. 
CD is equal to um, CMA plus CNB, right? You agree? I, what I've done in going from here to here is multiply both sides by C. Are you there with me, Remiji? And then I think what we can do is rewrite each of these C's using these factoids that we know, right? So for example, I can rewrite this C as J times B. And how can I rewrite that C, which might be useful here? Yeah, I think so. Because what then is true? Uh, that means that CD is equal to CMJB. Oh, what? I lost my mind. Sorry, 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 sorry. CD is this C we're going to rewrite using as JB. So JBMA. And this one we're going to rewrite at just as you said, K A N B. Well, what are the key letters here? There's two key letters that really matter over here on this side. What do we see on this side, Remiji? We see A and B, and A and B is a factor of both of these. So CD is equal to a, B times, if we factor it out, J, M plus K, N. Do you see? So you win. I think we win. No? Isn't this what we wanted to prove? I forgot. Because, okay, JM plus KN, this is an integer. And we're saying AB times this integer is CD. So AB must divide CD. I mean, that's the definition of divisibility, that there exists some integer such that AB times that integer is CD. Awesome. the brackets <laughs> yeah maybe <laughs> no th th these are integers here k j m and n all of them are integers right so remember integer i mean i don't know if you knew these words but integers are a ring so you can multiply them, you can add them together, you will stay in ent integers.
uh, Iconic asks, how to work with exam stress? Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, um, uh, uh, study, you study real hard. I think if you study real hard, which is a ter terrible advice, uh, then you get stronger naturally. And the stronger that you get, the more natural confidence you'll have. So that's one way of attacking it. Um, but I think that inevitably, I mean, I remember, I, I would get nervous before an exam would come. Um, I be excited and nervous and all of that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know that I have a good, good strategy there for my last exam. Study went good for a long time until night before exam. I was making loads of mistakes for some reason. And I started stressing, stressing through the night until the exam. Oh, I see. Oh God, you got top of the class. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you must be doing something right. All right. And maybe it's that stress, you know, like a little bit of stress. I'm not sure that too much stress is a good thing, but a little bit of stress, if you find it motivating, might not be the worst, you know, you know, uh, uh if you read, uh, Anti-Fragility by Nassim Tlaib. Now, I'm not advocating for this or anything like that, but small stressors can make you stronger in the long run is his uh, one of his theses in uh, that book. Nassim Tlaib. Nas or am I saying his name right? I, I hope I'm not messing it up. Nassim Nicholas Taleb or Tlaib. I'm not sure how to say it. His, uh, the thesis of the book is that phenomena come in three flavors. There are things which are fragile, which fragile things don't like variance, right? They break under variance. There's things which are robust. These are things which can tolerate fragility or tolerate variance. And then there are things that are anti-fragile, which benefit from variance. And uh, Nassim advocates that we live our lives in an anti-fragile manner, try to make ourselves anti-fragile. intriguing the manga guide to calculus okay after our experience can we even find it online i don't know but um the manga guide to calculus after our experience with the manga guide to linear algebra i'm really scared of the influence that the 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 poor influence that the manga guide to calculus will have on the young people in this channel right now get all sorts of i don't want you all to have toxic ideas about um gender relations the the toxic ideas that, uh, about gender relations um that we got out of um the manga guide to linear algebra This is what my life has come to. This is it.
Oh, at least my namesake's not one of the uh, the authors. This looks like a corporate. Uh, is this this is gonna be some corporate corporate manga? Oh, it, you know, uh, you know how many mangas I've read in my life. This is my second. The first one was the manga guide to linear algebra, and it was trash. It was absolute trash. Now, by the way, we are going to skip all the math content in this. The math content of the linear algebra one seemed okay. But we'll see what they have to say here. Let's extend this. Let's make this window bigger, shall we? Oh, no, I can't do it that way. I have to do it this way. Oops. For some reason, I apologize. My computer likes to change the color on Firefox. Oh, look, this is a cheaply scanned version. Look at this. I'm not sure if I, I, is this kosher? There are some things that only manga can do. What exactly are those things? What exactly are those things? Huh? Huh? What is a function? Uh-oh. The Yeah, okay, fine. The Asag Asagaki Times Sanda Times's Sanda Cho office must be around here. What oh, the Asagaki Times Sanda Cho office must be around here. Just think, me, Noriko Hikima, a journalist. My career starts here. How's calculus? It's a small newspaper and just a branch office, but I'm still a journalist. I'll work hard. The Asagaki Times Sandacho distributor. A newspaper distributor? Sandacho office? Do I have the wrong map? It's next door. You're looking for the Santa Cho branch office? Everybody mistakes us for the office because we are larger. What a handsome man. Asagaki Time Santa Cho branch office. Whoosh. Oh no, it's a prefab. Don't get upset, Noriko. It's a branch office but it's still the real Asagaki Times. What? I'm reading it backwards? Jesus Christ. Wait, so I'm, is it supposed to, I'm supposed to look at this and then that and then this? Wait, which one do I read first? Here goes nothing. Good morning! Oh, and a layabout. Here's a layabout. I'm a lingerer. I'm dead. What is that sentiment? Lunch delivery? Typical. 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 Hey, if anybody wants to set me free, okay? Get me out of this hell, uh, reading this, gar um, if you have a math question, just type exclamation point join, or just say it, just say it, okay? Just say it and I will, I will do my best, okay?
What? Lunch delivery? Will you leave it, please? Wait, what? Oh, you have been assigned here today. I'm Noriko Hikima. Long trip, wasn't it? I'm Kakeru Seki, the head of this office. The big guy there is Futoshi Masui, my only soldier. Just two of them, huh? This is a good place, a perfect environment for thinking about things. Thinking? Yes, thinking about facts. A fact is somehow related to another fact. Unless you understand these relationships, you won't be a real reporter. Did I promise? I don't know if I promised, but I was peer pressured into it by all these fuckers in chat. True journalism. Yay, true journal. Yeah, how is journalism linked to calculus? Well, you majored in the humanities. Yes, that's true. I've studied literature since I was a junior in high school. You have a lot of catching up to do then. Let's begin with functions. F functions math what <laughs> I call it peer pressure when one thing changes it influences another thing a function is a correlation you can think of the world itself as one big function this is a maniacal look. A function describes a relation, causality, or change. As journalists, our job is to find the, the reason why with the, is to find the reason why things happen. The causality. Yes, oh my god, she's pissed. This is not what she signed up for. Do you know a function is often expressed as y equals f of x? Nope. For example, assume X and Y are animals. Animal X, F, animal Y. Assume X is a frog. Assume X is a frog. You put the frog into box F and convert it. Tadpole Y comes out of the box. But uh, what is F? F stands for function, naturally. F is used to show that the variable Y has a particular relationship to X. And we can actually use any letter instead of F. X equals frog. Assume X equals frog. In this case, F expresses the relationship or rule between a parent and an offspring. Oh, this is such a bad this is the this is terrible because a parent can have more than one offspring yes this is worse I feel like the the uh, linear algebra well so it's worse Mathematically, I mean, I'm th this this F is a very very bad choice of F. Okay, terrible. Um, but at least it's not quite as toxic. At least she's not like um, sweeping the floors and making the guys um, miso soup or anything like that. At least we have not seen that yet. Anyway, okay, now look at this. For example, the relationship between e incomes and expenditures can be seen as a function. Caviar sales drown during recession. Oh, thank God. Why can't all functions be mapped? What does that mean? What does it mean for a function to be mapped? Thank God. 
So we have to restrict some graphs in order to inverse them. Ah, yeah, uh, I know exactly what you're talking about. So you're talking about um, a certain property that some functions have that other functions don't. Okay, um, and you're, what you're what you're talking about is the horizontal line test for graphs, but also it's called one to oneness or in injectivity of functions. And there are functions out there which are not injective. Let me show you one. You know this function. You've seen it. It's the most, I think, it's the easiest example of a non-trivial, non-injective function, f of x equal to x squared. If we draw its graph, it looks like this. Oh my God. Thank God. I mean, okay. You're going to make fun of me. You're all laughing right now. How dare you? I'd like to see you do better. Okay. Now, um, the, this function is not injective. So not, well, I'm going to say it like this, not one to one. I'm not going to use that word injective. It's too scary. It's not one to one. And the reason that it's not one to one is for the following basic fact that you know quite well. If we per pick a particular value of y, like let's say four, then what we know is that there are in fact not just one value of x, which when plugged into f would give four, but rather there are two such values. There's two, of course, but then there's the other one negative two. Either of these, when squared, gives you four. Hard to, hard to disagree, right? But what that means is that there is no function, there is no function which is an inverse of this function. x squared is not invertible as a function. This is the fact x squared is not invertible as a function now i know what you're thinking you're thinking yes it is the square root function what about the square root function isn't that an inverse for x squared no it's not it is related to x squared of course but it is not an inverse for x squared the reason is precisely because of this, I don't even want to call it a pathology, but this phenomenon that there are two distinct values which give you four. Now, if we had an inverse of this function, we would be unable to, uh, uh, if we had an inverse for this function, I guess like the inverse wouldn't know, should we pick, should we output two or should we output negative two? So the way that we, deal with this pathology, if you want to call it that, the way that we deal with it is to restrict the domain. So let's take a new function. A, it's definitely a different function. Let's call it g of x. It's going to be x squared again, but now instead of the domain of this being the all real numbers, we're going to restrict the domain we're going to declare that the domain of this function is from zero to positive infinity. Now, what's the graph of this guy look like? It's not defined for x less than zero. It's only defined for x greater than or equal to zero. It looks like this. That's what the graph looks like. And now what you see is that for every possible value of the function, every possible value of x squared, there is exactly one value of x, which whose square is that value. And you can check for, for every possible value, for every element of the range of g, there is exactly one element of the domain of g which when evaluated by G gives you that value. Synthblade 7080, thanks for the follow. Is that clear? Now, 
geometrically, the way you can distinguish this thing, these things, these situations, these state of affairs, is by looking at something called the horizontal line, horizontal line test. You can draw a horizontal line in the plane. And if that horizontal line intersects the graph in more than one point, then the function is not one to one. This function, however, is one to one because every horizontal line intersects the graph in exactly one point, or sorry, one point or zero points, because down here, the uh, horizontal line fails to intersect the graph at all. So this is one-to-one. -one. And one-to-one-ness, you can think as, of as being synonymous with invertible. And in fact, we know what the inverse function is in this case. G inverse of x, we have expression for it, is square root of x. Now, listen, we could also restrict the domain. I'll, I'll get to your question in Iconic in just a sec. We could also restrict the domain to some other interval, not zero to infinity, but we could also go from zero to negative infinity, couldn't we? And the function would be one to one on that interval as well. So it would be invertible. But humanity has decided that when we write square root of x, what we mean is the positive square root of x. So in other words, in defining square root of x, humanity as a convention has decided to restrict x squared in this particular fashion and in no other. This is a convention though, because again, we could have equally well have taken g of x or taken uh, a x squared, let's say this, let's, we could define a function h of x equal to x squared, whose domain now is uh, from negative infinity to zero. We could do that. And this would be an invertible function. And maybe we could call the inverse of this function square root of x still. Of course, we'd be flying in the face of convention, uh, that the convention that humanity has decided upon, but we could do it. Instead, what uh, in this case, though, what we would get is that h inverse of x is equal to negative square root of x if we follow the convention that humanity has established. Okay? Now, about x cubed. Cube root always has a specific value, but the function is not always one-to-one. -one. Wrong. It is always one-to-one. -one. There is always a unique value associated to x cubed for every, there, there, there's always a unique x, which gives you x, uh, <laughs> here's the function, let's draw it. You've seen it before, but let's just draw it. Here's y equals x cubed, looks like this. Like that, right? This function is one to one. Swear to God, it's not perfect. Whatever, it's one to one. Draw any horizontal line that you like. The that horizontal line will intersect this blue curve exactly once. So this is one to one. And so humanity doesn't need any convention for this. Uh, if we call this function here uh, f of x, then humanity agrees. F inverse of x is what we call the cube root of x. Another place where this arises is uh, in the inverse trig functions. Oh, sure. Okay. So hold on. Sure, 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 sure. Not every cubic is one to one. Not every cu cubic polynomial is a one to one function. Definitely not. Um, so, oh God, let's get it. Uh, uh, oh God. Uh, okay. Um, for example, let's just goof around with Desmos because it's so good. So there's X cubed. We could also do something like plus, uh, I don't know, three. Oh, that does nothing. Okay, that's nothing interesting. How about two X? 
Oh, that's not so interesting. How about 2x squared? Oh, inter interesting. This guy here is not one to one, is it? Right, because for example, we could look at the line y equal to one, and we see that it intersects the graph in three different places. So if we wanted an inverse for y equal to x cubed plus two x squared, we would be forced to restrict the domain of y to various intervals. For example, we could restrict the domain of x to be only on positive integers. Because you can see that here, if we, if we ignore all negative values of x, then this function is one to one. By the way, we could also restrict it to be between one and whatever this point right here is. It looks like four, negative four thirds. If we restricted x cubed plus two x squared to that interval, we would also have an invertible function. And if we had uh, restricted to from negative infinity to negative four thirds, we'd also have one. Cool, great, awesome. Hey, buy one, get 16 free. It's your turn. Oh, I don't know why I can't, okay. One to one means that, no, it doesn't mean bijective. One to one means uh, injective. If you know the if you know the lingo, by one to oneness, I'm saying I I mean uh, injective. Combinatorics question about restricted integer composition. There is an expression relating the number of restricted compositions of some integer to the coefficient of some term in a polynomial. Uh, while I understand what the expression says, I'm not sure why it should be true. The coefficient in front of x to the n of the polynomial allegedly gives the number of compositions of, inter, uh, of, of n for integers in a. So I don't know what compositions are. Are they ways of expressing n as a sum? A sum using k of the elements of A. Like this makes sense to me. Uh, okay. So if you look at, uh, okay, okay. Mm -mm. Right, um, so if you look at this thing, sum from Sum an A in this subset of, so A is a subset, I guess, of positive integers, or I don't know, does it matter? I guess it matters. Z plus, can we do that? Or Z greater than or equal to zero, maybe I should write. Greater than or equal to one, I don't know. Let's say positive, okay, good. Um, then we can look at the sum from A, e, a and A of uh, X to the A, 
and we can raise this whole thing to the kth power. So let's just take a really clean example. Let's say that A, if A was equal to, I don't know, 1, 3, and 8. I'm just, I'm just whatevering. Uh, then we have the sum of, well, I don't even need to write the sum. Never mind. I, we're going to have a, a polynomial with three terms. We're going to have x to the first plus x cubed plus x to the eighth. And this whole thing gets raised to um, some power. So like, let's say that we had, um, I don't know, power of three. So what we're going to be looking at, well, okay, so this is equal to, I'm not going to explain this, x plus x cubed plus x to the eighth times itself three times. Now let's think about how one takes, how one, how one would ex expand this expression. How would one expand this expression? So in my opinion, the way that you would expand this expression is by looking at all possible ways of choosing one of the terms from each of the three copies of this polynomial. So like one possible way is if we chose x cubed here, x to the eighth here, and x to the eighth there. What would that generate for us? If we multiplied those three terms together, we get x cubed times x to the eighth times x to the eighth. Isn't that x to the 19th? So in other words, th that, that choice of x cubed here, x to the eighth there, x to the eighth there, would get us an x to the 19th power. And what I'm assuming, so, so that's one possible composition of 19, is 3 plus 8 plus 8. Do you see, do you see what's happening there? Another possible composition of 19, I think, is 8, 3, 8? I'm not sure. Uh, is this, is it, uh, are we okay with this? Is this a different composition? What would that correspond to as a choice of three of, 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 of these terms? That would correspond to x to the eighth, x cubed, and that x to the eighth there. If we do that product, we would again get 19. So we would get another, a, another x to the 19th. So we'd have a coefficient thus far of 2. And finally, we would have one more corresponding to um, 8, 8, and three, so that means we choose um, this one, that one, and that one. So in other words, in if we were to expand this out, the coefficient of x to the 19 would be three, but that's also counting the number of, I guess, compositions of elements of A, which give you 19, Yeah, and in fact, if you were to expand this whole thing out and write everything, then you would get... Okay. I really, I mean, I, this is the idea, I think, for the more general factoid. You get all possible, whatever, compositions of a given integer by looking at the coefficient of x to that integer. In this case, you're talking about x to the n 
in the expansion of this polynomial. I really, yeah, I really think it makes sense. Okay. If anybody else has a question about math, just ask, okay? I would love to help you. Otherwise, I've been peer pressured into reading a manga about calculus. For example, the relationship between incomes and expenditures can be seen as a function. Like how when the sales at a company go up, the employees get bonuses. <laughs> how quaint, how quaint. X43 scramjet reaches Mach 9.6, new record. The speed of sound and the temperature can also be expressed as a function. When the temperature goes up by one degree centigrade, the speed of sound goes up by 0.6 meters per second. 0.6 meters per second. And the temperature in the mountains goes down by about 0.5 centigrade each time you go up 100 meters, doesn't it? How do people know this shit? Do you get it? We are surrounded by functions. I see what you mean. We have tiny, plenty of time here to think about these things quietly. The things you may, the things you think about here may become useful someday. I think that's called foreshadowing, personally. I think that's foreshadowing. It's a small office, but I hope you will do your best. Yes, I will. Plomp. Whoa. Ouch. Are you all right? Oh, lunch is here already. Where is my beef bowl? Pure, raw sexism. Fatoshi, lunch hasn't come yet. This is not yet. Well, maybe it's not. Maybe any new person. Maybe if this was a man, uh, maybe he wouldn't be saying that. Who knows? Not yet. Please wake me up when their lunch is here. Zzz. No, Futoshi, we have a new... Has lunch come? No, not yet. It's like they're repeating themselves. All right, this is math bullshit. Nobody cares. Let's differentiate a function. The Asagaki Times, Sandacho office. All right, I'm done for the day. Tap, tap. Noriko, I heard a posh Italian restaurant just opened nearby. Would you like to go? Wow, I love Italian food. Let's go. Big mistake. Don't mix business with pleasure. Don't mix business with pleasure. This is how you get um, human resources on your ass, okay? Just be advised. But you're finished already? It's not even noon. This is a branch office. We operate on a different schedule. Glimpse to editor subject today's headlines. A bear rampages in a house again. No injuries. The reputation of Sandacho watermelons improves in the prefecture. Do you always file stories like this? Local news like this is not bad. Besides, human interest stories can be politics, foreign affairs, the economy. I want to cover the hard hitting issues. Ah, uh, that's impossible. This dude is, this layabout is always eating, always thinking about food. Never any time for hard hitting journalism or functions for I've not seen this guy mention functions once and functions are all around him has he not heeded the lesson of this this guy 
who apparently has facial hair. At first I thought it was a misprint, but he has facial hair. It's very, very, very sparse though. It's not like a summit he here meeting will be held around here. Nothing exciting ever happens, and the time goes by very slowly. I knew it. I don't want to work here. Melons, pigs, produce, radishes, carrots, farmers, cows. Noriko, you can still benefit from your experiences here. I don't know which be beat you want to cover, but I will train you well so that you can be accepted at the main office. By the way, do you think the Japanese economy is still experiencing deflation? I think so. I feel it in my daily life. The government report repeatedly said that the economy would recover, but it took a long time until signs of a recovery appeared. A true journalist must first ask himself, what do I want to know? I have a bad feeling about this. Hmm. Hmm. If you can approximate what you want to know with a simple function, you can see more clearly. Here, we use a linear expression. Y equals AX plus B. My math? Again? I knew it. Okay. This is hurting, hurting me. Does anybody have a math question? Now we, what we want to know most, if you have a math question, you can ask. Is if prices are going up or down? Look, approximating the fluctuation in prices with y equals ax plus b gives. How did, okay, whatever. So if a is negative, we know that deflation is still continuing. That's right. You're a quick study. Growl. Now let's do the rest at the Italian restaurant. Let's get out of here. Don't know what that means. Futoshi, we're leaving for lunch. Don't eat too many snacks. Speaking of snacks. Okay, this is an important moment here. This guy, I don't remember what his name is. He needs to be real careful here. This is a dangerous lead in. I don't know, I have not read the rest of this, but speaking of snacks, pause. watch yourself, buddy. Watch yourself. Do you know about Johnny Fantastic? The rock star whose book on dieting has become a bestseller? Yes, of course he does. But he suddenly began to wait, began to gain weight again after a bad breakup. Oof. Poor Johnny. Although his agent warned him about it. My weight gain has already passed its peak. He was certain. Now what his agent wants us to know is whether Johnny's weight gain is really slowing down, like he said. Uh, you're right. Let's imit imitate his weight gain with AX, y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. Weight gain is accelerating. Weight gain is slowing down. If A is positive, his weight gain is accelerating. And if A is negative, it's slowing down. Good, you're doing well. There are lots of tight curves around here. Okay, anybody got a question? Anybody got a question about anything? Um, oh, Iconic, excellent, has a question. How is the regression value calculated?
Oh, the regression value? Or do you mean like the regression line? So what is the, oh gosh, sorry. I'm, I'm ignorant about statistics. I think, is that the R or R squared quantity? The product moment correlation coefficient. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think you make Excel do it for you. <laughs> I don't know how that R is produced. I'm sorry. I know, I know what it represents as a sort of, uh, yeah, you can use a calculator. I'm sure it will do it for you. I was thinking you could do it with a spreadsheet or something like that, but I, I don't know. Um, I don't actually don't know the meaning of it. Oh no, I think that statistics, um, I mean, I think that it's, it's a, uh, it's a serious field in the sense that, you know, things are done rigorously in the theory of statistics. Um, it's just not a field that I'm particularly familiar with. I mean, statistics is a very serious field is what I'm trying to get at. What's the best advanced math statistics course you suggest? The best? You're basically asking what's the best math or the best statistics course? Um, you know, at a certain point, as you go deeper and deeper, so first of all, I want you to understand that math is a very, very wide, it, it is enormous. Math as a, as a field, the, the types of things, the, 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 the things which get categorized as math, well, that is a very, very widely diverse set of things. There are many, 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 many topics out there in mathematics that count as mathematics. Um, and typically, when you are going through your studies, as you go deeper and deeper into math and spend more and more time studying it, what inevitably happens is you have to sort of look ignore much of mathematics so that you can go deeper into one particular field deep enough that you can actually start producing your own new your own new and novel results theorems and such um so a lot of that at some point, like you're, you're, you're deciding what sort of subfield you want to get into. A lot of that is a matter of taste, honestly. I mean, it's all might also be sociological. I mean, there's a lot of factors at play there, but, uh, what I'm trying to get at is that the answer to your question will be different for different folks. So I can't make a suggestion in good conscience, uh, without giving you that warning my favorite classes uh when i was well as an undergrad for example were algebra classes but at a certain point i started enjoying much more topology um and geometry as uh things to study and i ended up studying or making my subfield i guess geometry but of course you ask some other person, of course they're going to say something different. Because we develop a, a taste or an aesthetic or other considerations, perhaps, for why we chose the fields that we did. I hope that that gives you a good picture of what's going on. Ew, no. Uh, no. I don't like dairy. I don't want it on my foods. Not a fan. I like um, some bit of salt, bit of uh, spicy stuff on it. 
like a salsa, I'm down for that. Yeah, chili sounds great. Not I'm lactose intolerant, okay? I'm lactose intolerant. I'm not afraid to say it. I'm lactose intolerant. So, um and actually I one of yeah. As a child, I hated milk. Lactose free cheese? I don't know what that is. I know that there's vegan cheese and most of it is absolutely abhorrent. <laughs> is really bad. But um uh I had um this one from one one brand of vegan cheese called uh Chow Cheese made by I think a company called Field Roast. Yeah, uh if I drank milk right now, first of all, it would be disgusting cuz milk is just inherently disgusting, okay? Um oh, well okay, wait. I hated milk as a child, but I did drink milk one time. I I don't wouldn't I don't want to say I was peer pressured into it, but uh I drank milk one time and I actually did enjoy it. It was ice cold though. Ice cold milk. And I actually did like it. I drank it. It was like the only thing to drink. I went to this uh, sleepaway camp in sixth grade. Um, I enjoyed it, I have to say. I drank it. I drank the whole glass. Uh, but I am lactose intolerant. <laughs> um, so I did pay the price later. It makes my stomach cramp up. Uh, to get more graphic, I have, you know, diarrhea and that sort of thing that happens as a result. What you can do though is get these pills called uh you can get these pills called uh with, with the lactose uh or sorry, the lactase in them and you can uh swallow those before you eat dairy. And you'll be okay. You'll be able to digest it. Um, yeah, I don't like yogurt either, but, um, yeah. I, you know, I have always had a fantasy of being like one of those people in mission control. I don't want to be an astronaut. I have no desire to be an astronaut. Uh, but I've always wanted to be one of those people in mission control. You know that scene in, um, I don't remember, is it Apollo 13? And they're like trying, they're, they're trying to uh, figure out how to get the damaged spacecraft back home safely. And they're, you know, they're in a rush because, you know, time is of the essence and all of that. And so there's like some radio call in and the, uh, you know, the, the astronauts, they need to verify some uh, like maybe coordinates or a bearings or something like that in order to get through the atmosphere safely. I don't know. I'm making this up. I'm not, probably not getting this right. But the, then um, the so that they relay the coordinates and there was like a line of engineers, okay? And they all look the same. <laughs> They're all wearing the same white shirt with black tie. They all have the same haircut. And they go down the line, verifying the cal the, cal the um, bearing calculation. And it's like, yep, check. And then they go down the line. There's like 10 of them. And they're like, yes, yes, thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up, all the way down the line. I've always wanted to be one of those clones. I had a fantasy of being one of those clones. But you know what I discovered? You know what would be my downfall? I suck at arithmetic, and I'd almost certainly kill the heroes on board Apollo 13. So they need to, they need, I, I, my conscience will not allow me to accept such an offer by NASA. Nope, can't do it.
I'd kill those poor people. I got peer pressured, peer pressured into doing it. I have a weakness of will. I did not stand up to my chat. Oh, but okay. So, um, yeah, I like groups more than rings. Why? Groups are more relevant to sort of my life, I guess. To other things that I'm interested in. Whereas rings are not. I like groups because I like fundamental groups. Those are cool as fuck. I like them. They're awesome. Like it. I like weird, um, you know, like finitely presented groups and such. Uh, rings are all right, but they're complicated. I think I might have some PTSD from a certain class that I had taken in grad school still. Um, but yeah, no, 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 I don't know. It's really, it's really just a matter of taste. Okay. I like, I happen to like groups. I happen to like group theory more than ring theory. It's and it is it it's not close for me. I really feel a lot of warmth, a lot of positive vibes around groups. I like groups, but rings, those are scary. They, they're out to get me. They seem dangerous. <laughs> hey, you're getting closer to magmas with groups than with rings. What? I don't know what the secretary problem is. Representation theory. What is it? Representation theory is, um, well, the definition of a representation is very simple. A representation is just a homomorphism of a group into matrices. Let G be a real valued function whose do domain is a set of real numbers R. Suppose that G is continuous on R such that maybe this isn't so bad. Maybe we can just, um, yeah. For example, we can pretty clearly see that G has a critical point at X equals zero, right? In other words, G prime of zero is zero. Just that follows just from this thing. So uh, G prime of zero is sine of zero, which of course is zero, plus a G squared of zero. And you might be like, oh my God, what is that? Well, it's nine, but who cares? Because here we get the integral from zero to zero of G of T dt, which must be zero. So this whole thing is zero. So we know then that we have a critical point and so we're left to figure out what g double prime at zero is. And depending on the sign of g double prime at zero, we can determine whether this critical point corresponds to a local minimum or a local maximum, or perhaps neither, or, uh, or well, whatever. We can hope that we can find an answer there. So what we should do is take the derivative of this. G double prime of x. The derivative of sine of x, I think, is cosine of x. Is that right?
And then we use uh, the product rule, right? So the derivative of g squared of x with respect to x is 2g of x times g prime of x. You agree? Yeah, I don't know if Desmos can graph it. Does it have integrals? Let's, let me just try real fast. Uh, int. Um, wait, but we're not, we don't know what G is. <laughs> so I guess it does have integrals. All right. We don't know what G is, so. Not even plus E, I know, right? I noticed that as well. Do I offer tutoring? Um, I kind of think of this as being tutoring. Um, <clears throat> this thing. Tutoring for everybody, for free. Um, I've not thought about trying, I, I'm not doing tutoring like as a, as a thing. I've not done that like one-on-one -on -one tutoring, if that's what you mean. Um, but I suppose if the price is right or whatever. No, but right, right now we're just doing this kind of stuff. You can DM me if you want to, we can talk about it, but I've not really considered it. So anyway. Let's just keep going here. I think this is the way to go. So I'm, I've taken the derivative of g squared. Now we multiply this by this. And we add to this now the first bit left alone times uh, the derivative of the integral bit, which of course is g of x. Is this making sense? Uh, whoever asked this question, I can't remember now. Does, does this calculation make sense? Good. So now we can compute g double prime of zero, or we hope we can anyway g double prime at zero is one plus two times g of, well, actually this whole term, please note, is wrong? Did I mess up? Oh, it's wrong. I'm sorry, it is wrong. Oh my God, it's negative g cubed. You're right. You're right, I'm wrong. That was my bad. Yeah, because you can, um, what the fundamental theorem of calculus tells you, right, is that the integral from zero to x of g of t dt is a, is a, um, uh, the derivative of that is g of x, right? But if we have the order reversed as we do here, then we have a negative sign that gets attached. In other words, we could rewrite this integral here as negative the integral from zero to x g of t. So when we take the derivative of that, we get negative g of x and not g of x. Does that make sense? Thanks for catching that. Okay, great. So one, so I'm sticking zero in now and hopefully we're good. This whole thing is zero because of course when x is zero, this integral is zero. So this whole thing is zero. So then we get one minus g cubed at zero. And we are told that g at zero is three. So this is equal to one minus 
27, which is negative 26. And I don't know much, but I'm pretty sure that's negative. So the fact that that's negative means that the function g is concave down. The graph is concave down, frowny face, at 0. And so the critical point, x equals 0, is a um, thing. Oh, wait. I'm sorry. There's a second part to the question. g of pi over 2. We want to show that it's either plus or minus the square root of 2. Oh, no need for the second part. Okay, great. Because I don't, <laughs> I don't see it. But okay, awesome. Good to hear. If I have a group G acting on itself by left multiplications, by left multiplication, are the orbits transitive? So, first of all, you don't say is an orbit transitive. Like that, that's, um, you ask if a group action is transitive. And a group action is transitive if there is a single orbit. I really hope I'm getting my words right. That's what transitive means, right? A single orbit? Right. Um, so what do you think? Is every... So if, if it was transitive, that would mean that every pair of elements in G would be related by left translation. So if you pick an arbitrary, like, G and G1 and 8, uh, G, G and H, if you have arbitrary, so uh, G, uh, G acts transitively on X. So let's just be a little bit more um, general. G acts transitively on X if for all uh, x1 and x2 in x, um, x1 in x as well, of course, x1 in x and x2 in x, there exists a g in, in g. There exists a g in big G such that um, G acting on, let's say, X1 is equal to X2. That's very good, but you know what? I think, and you know what? Your intuition is spot on. But I think that what you should be able to do is identify the G which will get the job done. In other words, I want you to show me because I think it's important for your life. I want you to tell me, if I give you a G and an H inside G, big G, sorry. If I give you a small, fuck. If I give you a J and a K inside a big G, I want you to be able to tell me a group element which takes J to K under left this multi left multiplication action. Hi, Merrick. Hi, Merrick. Him, Eric. Him, Eric. Him, Eric. What the fuck is that? X, two, what the what? I can't read that. What does that say? x2 times 1 to the negative 1? Oh, yeah, uh...
Wait, so here's J and here's K. These are elements of G. What is the group element which takes J to A, J to K under left multiplication? I think you I think you have it. I just couldn't read it for a sec. What's the group element which takes J to K? So J and K, suppose J and K are elements of G. I want you to construct for me a group element which takes J to K under this group operation, this group action of left multiplication. I think you can be extremely explicit triple x explicit okay and tell me a group element which takes j to k oops excuse me sorry about that yeah exactly right kj inverse you got it kj inverse acts on j by left multiplication so j goes to kj inverse j which is k yeah you got it so that means that the group action is transitive because every par pair of elements Every pair of elements are re related to one another by this group action. I'll be right back. All right. So we want to know what the uh, you want to know what the issue is now. The issue is that. Um, well, this is right now I'm streaming from my desktop computer. I also have a work computer a desktop, which is a, a Linux machine, and I brought it home. And so now it's sitting downstairs, but it's a Linux machine. And the problem, the issue is that Linux doesn't run Roblox. Or rather, I don't know how to get it to work. Or rather, I don't want Roblox on my work machine. That's that's it right there. And so uh, now the boy wants a new computer. A Windows machine. You might ask, why don't you dual boot? Ah, no, I'm not doing that. What does Roblox work in wine? chess <laughs> a can record we have we have those already he seems uninterested in fact whenever i play my music he always gets really mad <laughs> i feel like he's usually a very chill boy i feel like the stream is getting the wrong idea because you don't hear from him when he's being nice and sweet <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, you know what? Honestly, I've not even tried to do it. I think Roblox, Roblox looks like trash to me. It just looks disgusting looking. Uh, but I like Minecraft. Do I think art and music will benefit my children? Yeah, well, I, I definitely think so. No, they know how I said <laughs> I've they know how I feel about Roblox. Believe me. I'm not uh, I don't keep these things to myself. But it turns out that these dipshit YouTubers they watch have more sway over how they spend their free time than their old father does. No. Nah. Fuck Roblox. No amount of peer pressure is going to get me to do it. No, that's, no, I have. no, I don't care about competitive math. Frankly, I don't even care about math. I think what's important for them to learn are um, uh, computer programming. Much more important to me that they learn that. 
If they want to do math, of course I'm there for that. But, you know, I mean, if they don't like math, then how cruel would that be to push them in that direction, right? Now, they better know how to do basic math. There's no question about that. So, yeah, they're going to know their, like, uh, three-digit multiplications and such. <laughs> who... Who knows what they want to be really when they grow up, when they're 8, 9, 10, 11. It's ridiculous. The idea. But knowing Yoshi, he's a very unique boy. He's super interested in systems. So like, uh, I'm talking about things like... Um, Like computer systems, I think. So like, okay, I'm about to reveal something. He watches, for example, video compilations of Windows error screens. Through the years, like in the various versions of Windows, Windows errors, Windows error screens. So, I I mean, like, that was not an interest of mine when I was a kid. My boy, like, he he was doing Python. Um, yeah, people, there are YouTube videos. You can go look. You can go look. There are YouTube videos on this stuff. Uh, he's obsessed with ringtones. He knows like, you know, the standard Samsung ringtone through the years, that sort of stuff. Really into like, like, you know, and, and he's really into like Minecraft servers. He's got a Minecraft server set up on my computer. I think arts are very important. Yeah, I do. And I don't like the current... I'm not sure if it's still happening. But certainly like five years ago, there was a lot of uh, shitting upon them old humanities subjects. Arts and culture is bullshit. Does he play with Redstone? Uh, uh, like... He watches a video and then mimics the video. So I, I'm not sure if that counts, but he's definitely done stuff like that. And command blocks. He's really into command blocks in Minecraft. Is that Redstone? Well, I was really impressed because he was doing some Python stuff. He was doing code combat, you know, code combat. And he was doing that game. And, uh, you know, you had to at some point say, like you had to get your hero to say something. And basically, you know, heroes, heroes say, and then you write some text, right? And he was like, why is this not working, dad? And he's maybe screaming, I don't remember. And I told him, oh, the problem is you need to put quotation marks around that thing. And he's like, oh, of course. I need to have quotation marks around it because it needs to be a string. And I was like, yeah, that's right, Yoshi. How did you know that? Because I feel like that's the kind of thing, that's the kind of abstraction that um, not all young children get. Not all adults get either. But yeah. All right. Inverse function. So we have f of x equals square root of 4 minus e to the x minus 2. Well, first, oh, is the, the whole thing over, uh, is the square root over the whole thing? No, that would be weird. It's just over this piece, right? Yeah. Um, 
So if e to the x is too big, then the thing under the square root is negative. And we can't have that. Quiet. Be quiet. We can't have that because the square root of a negative number is not defined. Quiet. Quiet. So we need to be careful. This thing is not defined for all x. Do you understand what I'm saying, cursive monk? Yeah, okay, good. So uh, let's see, where then is it defined? Well, I don't know, but I mean, we could figure it out. Just a, just an observation, I guess. But yeah, the idea here uh, is what learning balances say. Try to, well, try to express. So you write down the equation, y is equal to the square root of four minus e to the x minus two. What you wanna do is figure out the x which will give you this y, right? You wanna figure out the x which will give you this y. So what you are gonna do is take this equation and you're gonna to try to solve for x. That's the idea. If you know the x which gives you this y, then that expression, that, uh, that association between the value of y and the x which gives you that value of y, well, that via this function, well, that would be uh, your inverse function. It's a little hard to think about, I know. What I just said is a little bit in, uh, insane sounding, but honest to goodness, that's what the inverse function is, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so bottom line, bottom line, take this equation and solve it for x. Yeah, Desmos. Let's go look at Desmos real quick. Well, actually, let's try to solve this for x first, just analytically, okay? Just like with equations and shit. So, um, Curse of Monk, what's the first play? Okay, so maybe this is a maybe this is a pretty intense one, I don't know. Ask me anything. Yes, it is. Point nine repeating is definitely one. Your math teacher is full of shit. Isn't that unfortunate? That's, I'm sorry to inform you. Unless your math teacher um, gave you some additional sort of uh, assumptions to work with, your math teacher is misinformed severely. I'm sorry to inform you of that. It's a hard, it must be a hard thing to hear. Um, point nine repeating. Let's see. What's the right way of thinking about it? Point nine 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 dot dot dot. What's the right way of thinking about it? Well, maybe we could give it a name. Maybe we could let's give it a name. Sometimes when you don't know what something is, if you give it a name, it can help. So let's call it, I don't know, let's call it X. And what I want to show is that X is equal to one. So then Hmm. Let's multiply this by 10. At, oh yeah. Let's multiply both sides by 10. If we multiply it by 10, what do we get? We get 9.99 all the, yeah. Do you agree with this?
And now let's do 10x minus x. What's that? Well, if we have 9.9999999 and we subtract off 0.9999999, what do we get? We get 9. On the other hand, what's 10x minus x? It's 9x. And so what's x? It's 1. Told you. I'm right. Your math teacher is wrong. You should tell that to his or her face tomorrow. Oh, but tomorrow's Saturday. Base 11. No, okay, whatever. What is it, Yoshi? What? He wants a game on Steam called There Is No Game. Has anybody has anybody heard of There Is No Game on Steam? And is it suitable for children? He saw Dan TDM playing it. I don't know if you know, all know who Dan TDM is. But uh, that dude can sell a game to eight year olds. Yeah, Dan TDM's still a thing. <laughs> Did you know? Yeah, my, my older boy was going to lend him $50 at 10% interest for just a flat 10% interest. And I was like, no, we do not, we do not, we do, we don't practice usury on our family members. Okay. That's not going to happen. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, we don't charge interest. Um, Uh-oh. You have a question about f product measures and Fubini's theorem. Okay, stop. I don't know. I don't know anything about measure theory. Sorry. Exponential growth is fun. In 2020, exponential growth is not fun. Exponential growth describe. <laughs> For example, when there is a pandemic on your doorstep, okay? <laughs> Fuck exponential growth. Thanks for having such empathy for the goddamn virus vectorcom why is e to the i pi t plus one equal to zero okay gary i'm sh okay this is what i'm guessing is happening okay because you also asked about 0.9 repeating earlier here's what i think i don't know what what's what here's what i bet i bet your uh math teacher said that that was the most beautiful equation in all of mathematics. Am I right or am I wrong? I just need to know. Right. Somebody needs to have a talking to with your math teacher.
Send them to this stream, okay? Send them to this stream, and I will set them straight. Both about 0.9 repeating and about this being the most beautiful. Now, okay, it is a matter of aesthetics, I have to say. It is a matter of, of aesthetics. But what is far more beautiful, objectively, no, 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 not objectively, but far more beautiful than uh, e to the i pi plus one equaling zero, in my opinion, is uh, the thing which underlies it. It's called Euler's formula. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. Euler's formula. Ah. The restraint I'm showing here is impressive. I hope you all are appreciative. Euler's formula. Euler's formula. Euler's formula. So here, here it is. This is, in my opinion, far more beautiful. E to the I theta is equal to cosine theta plus I sine theta. This is so beautiful. This, I really do think is beautiful. I personally, it, some people might be like, gives a shit. But the thing that, the, the, the reason why I think that at the very least, this is more beautiful than the e to the i pi thing is because this implies the e to the i pi thing. This implies the e to the i pi thing. Because if you stick in theta equal to pi, stick it in, stick it in there, all right? If you stick it in, what you get is e to the i pi is equal to cosine pi plus i sine pi. And as you know, cosine pi is zero, so that dies. i sine pi, uh, no, no, excuse me, cosine pi is negative one. <laughs> i sine pi is zero, so this is, uh, e to the i pi is equal to negative one, and then you add one, and it's equal to zero. So what I'm trying to say is that here is a beautiful fact which applies for all values of theta, all the uncountably many values of theta. There are uncountably many possible values of theta that you can use in this formula, okay? Here is but one, and whoopity do you get this. In other words, this result is like the one millimeter thick layer of scum, of scum on the, po on the top of a beautiful, deep body of water. Okay. That's why this is objectively more beautiful than that. Okay. So then why is it that people go so crazy for this? It's because they fetishize constants. Okay. They fetishize pi. Pi. I mean, it's ridiculous. They have a pi day. Pi day. E. I, one and zero, people go crazy for uh, these numbers because they, they're, they're like, mm -mm, mm -mm. this is superficial shit. This is the deep fact that you want. This is the deep fact that you want. This is the deep fact that will um, leave you feeling satisfied. This, this is like, um, this is like Coca-Cola. It's disgusting. It, Tastes good in the moment, but it leaves a bitter aftertaste. And it's like a cloying, sugary, syrupy thing in the back of your throat all day long. This is like the never-ending water bottle that will uh, keep you hydrated and thinking clearly and cleanly for the rest of your life. This is godlike. This is... For the birds. Demonic. Boring. Ah, it's just it's just it's just too just too limited.
You don't really learn much from this. This tells the tale of a thousand, thousand different tales here. This, whatever. Now, of course, this fits better on a bumper sticker. Hmm? I think there, there is a non-zero probability that your math teacher has this on his or her bumper uh, bumper right now. This, uh, a, a bumper sticker of this. I wonder what the probability is. Definitely not zero. Or maybe a t-shirt. Yes, I was going there as well. Or maybe like a gold chain with one of these things uh, with the print. Don't fall for the glitz and glamour. Don't fall for it, okay? This is not where it's at. This is where it's at, okay? O o Euler's formula. You're welcome. We're changing lives here on the stream. What? Well, made up your mind? Oh, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to look at it first. I'm going to have to figure out whether it's age appropriate. Oh, he's mad about that. Um, so there's two notations that or two things that you need to uh, get acquainted with. The first is what's called the indefinite integral. This is what it's called in calculus. The indefinite integral. So we denote this like this, integral f of x dx. And what this is, is the set of antiderivatives. I think this is what you're asking. So, for example, when we are asked to compute this quantity, what we should write down is x squared plus c, and that is the truth. And the reason is because every function of the form x squared plus c for some choice of c has a derivative equal to 2x. So these are what are called antiderivatives. Hi, Uncle Bill, Druin. All right, so that's called an indefinite integral. Now there's another quantity, which at first glance, well, it is a different quantity. It's a different thing altogether. It's called a definite integral. And this we denote in the following manner. We write some numbers. A and B here represent numbers. We have some function, f of x, that we are integrating. What this is, is the signed area. Signed area um, of the region uh, between y equals f of x, the graph, and the interval a, b on the x-axis. Jesus Christ, what the fuck is going on out there? Um, so if we draw a picture of this, If this is A and this is B, then what we are computing is the signed area of this region right here. What do we mean by signed? This piece here is positively counted and this piece down here is negatively counted. Okay? Okay, now listen to me. Don't these notations and don't the names of these things look incredibly similar? It's like they took the two letters from the, the phrase indefinite integral and they just put them here and there. Of course, they made them different. But it would be... but. Like basically the same amount of ink spell, spilled in writing both of these two things. But they look incredibly similar is the point that I'm trying to make. But their meanings are incredibly different from one another. 
this is a set of functions, whereas that is a, a number. It's a, ge it's a number associated um, to a geometric region, to a region rather, yeah? So how in the world are these things linked? Well, the miracle is that they are linked. And they're linked through something called, that sounds, its name is pretty, makes it sound pretty important. And you know what, it really is important. It's called the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. It says the following thing, if f is continuous, very mild, on uh, the interval from A to B, then um, we can define a function, g of x, and it's a funky function. It's a very funky function. Because this function is defined as a definite integral using this concept. I don't know if that person who asked this question is still here, but I'm, it's rolling, we're rolling here. There it is. There's the function. So what is this function doing? This function is outputting for us for any va particular value of x. This function is outputting for us the signed area. So if this is a and maybe this is x, what we are outputting with this function for this particular input x, we are outputting the signed area of this region. So again, x is variable, okay? x is variable. So what you want to imagine is that you can slide the value, this x here around, slide the x around. The graph of f doesn't change as you slide x around, but what does change, of course, is the value of the signed area. Can you sort of see that with your imagination? with your, uh, the eyeballs that are in your head, I mean inside your brain, the things we like to call here brain balls. Can you see that with your brain balls? That as you slide x around along the x-axis here, you're gonna get differing values for g. So this really is a function. Now here's, I'm not, this is not the fundamental theorem of calculus yet, yeah, we say brain balls around here. Um, to get the fundamental theorem of calculus, what? Right. I guess so. Oh, it's got charge on it. Not very much. They're gonna be playing all evening. Oh. Um. What was I saying? Brain balls. Uh, brain balls. Sorry, I'm hung up on brain balls. Oh, this is not the fundamental theorem of calculus yet. I haven't said anything. I haven't said anything yet. All I've done is define a function. But now here's, here's the amazing fact. Are you ready? Are you ready? Here's the amazing, miraculous fact. This function is an antiderivative of f. What? So what I'm saying is that d dx of g of x is equal to f of x. What you are seeing here in this theorem is the link between the indefinite integral and the definite integral. G of x is defined to be this definite integral thinger. And what I'm claiming, or what the fun, not what I'm claiming, what the fundamental theorem of calculus states is that the derivative of this function is in fact f of x. Fuck the proof. Anybody can read the proof on uh, on the internet or wherever. 
in their calculus book. What happened with A? Is it the plus? Oh, very good. This A here, you mean? This A? So you can think of this A here as representing sort of, um, as being representative, hmm, how can I say it? it? Yeah, definitely having something to do with the plus C, okay? Um, notice that if we plug A into this function, that we get zero, right? We could also define this G. Hmm, how, how should I say this? Like really what I want to say, and I don't know if these words are going to make any sense to you, but really what I want to say is that this A kind of is representative of like an initial condition in a certain what's called differential equation. But I have a feeling maybe these words are a little too scary at this point in your life. There are many antiderivatives, so there are many A's. Is that, is that a fair thing? Uh, th is that understandable? I hope so. But uh, really, the I think the role that this A plays is uh, best expressed in terms of initial conditions for differential equations. But if you don't know what I mean by that, don't worry about it right now, you will learn. At least I hope you will learn. Now, let's think about for a sec, let's think about the plausibility of this statement. The plausibility of this statement, I think is embodied by the fact that so what is d dx of g of x measuring? It's measuring how g changes in response to a tiny change in x. If we nudge x a little bit, we might ask, what is the corresponding change in g? So imagine that we sort of nudge x just a tiny little bit. I'm really exaggerating. That doesn't look like a tiny little bit. But imagine that we change x just a tiny little bit. What then will be the change, the corresponding change in G? Well, this is what I want to say, is that it's going to roughly look like F at X. That it's going to be roughly proportional, the change in the area will be roughly proportional to F evaluated at X. In other words, the sign, the, 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 sorry, this value right here of F. So in other words, this feels like a plausible statement. Are you with me there? The proof of the fundamental theorem of calculus, I think, really makes this apparent. You know what? Maybe we should prove it. Maybe, maybe the proof is illustrative in this case. So, like, if we take the limit as h goes to zero, uh, so we're, we're going to apply the definition of derivative to this, right? The proof is h goes to zero. Of uh, So what we need to look at is x, g of x plus h minus g of x divided by h, right? This is the definition of the derivative. You okay? You need help? Oh, yeah. Oh, please, please don't unplug my computer. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the, let's see, this is equal to the limit as h goes to zero. g of x plus h is the integral from a to x plus h of f of t dt minus the integral from a to x of f of t dt. Divide this whole thing by h. Now, this is equal to the limit as h goes to zero. Oh, yeah, okay. So now, 
if we take the integral from a to x plus h, this is just basic geometry. Or I don't even know if it's even fair to call it that, but everything is geometry, so it doesn't make any difference. So the integral from a to x plus h, and then we subtract off the integral from a to x, is it not clear that that's going to be the integral from x to x plus h? Sounds good. So we get this, we get this uh, equality, yeah. And now as h goes to zero, oh, uh, Wait, do I really need that? Is, I don't think this, this is an issue, is it? So the thing to imagine now is that as h goes to zero, gets close, so this is maybe x plus h here. As h gets closer and closer to zero, this area here is going to be better and better, so, this area right now is approximated by f of x times h, right? And this approximation is just going to get better and better and better as h gets, or yeah, as h goes to zero, um, and x plus h subsequently gets closer and closer to x. The way that you make this rigorous, this is a little bit hand wavy, but the way that you make this rigorous is by um, appealing to something called, I think, the mean value theorem for definite integrals. But let's not worry about that right now. Let's just say th this integral here is well approximated by f of x over h, or sorry, x of x times h, as h gets closer and closer to zero. So this looks like f of x times h over h. And then uh, we're going to kill these h's the limit as h goes to zero then is f of x. So what we have shown is that g prime of x is equal to f of x. Now, there is a little bit left to do, left to say, to really justify this equality here. And I think that the right reference there is the mean value theorem. But other than that, this is, this is golden. So that's the link. So I hope that was enlightening. Kvikende. Does anybody else have any questions about math or anything? Because at this point, I don't know if I can take any more of the manga guide to calculus, okay? Is it circular? What do you mean? Oh, well, the proof of the mean value theorem for integrals that I'm looking at depends on the fundamental theorem of calculus. So that does seem circular if the only proof is that way. Um, that seems bad. Um, Okay, so then how do calculus textbooks prove this then? Do I have my calculus textbook? The fundamental theorems of calculus. Okay, the proof of the fundamental theorem of calculus. So they get to here. 
and they use the mean value theorem for integrals to say there exists a C between there. Um, okay, okay. So then maybe they have a proof of the mean value theorem of integrals. So let's look that up. Two ninety three is what page it's on. Mean value theorem for definite integrals. Let a and b be numbers, and let f be a continuous function. Then there is a number between a and b such that this definite integral is equal to that. Oh, that's easy. Of course, this, okay. They do use the um, intermediate value theorem, yes. The authors of this text, Sherman K. Stein, and Anthony Barcelos, or Barcelos. I used this book when I was a uh, when I was an undergrad, lower division math, lower division calculus sequence. Nineteen ninety six is when I bought this book. So they use the intermediate value theorem. Let's just see if they prove the intermediate value theorem. Almost certainly not. Section 2.8, they say. Intermediate value theorem. Okay, there it is. I, I'm almost certain it doesn't prove the intermediate value theorem. Let's just look. Maybe it does. Index. Enter. Immediate value theorem, 81 and 89, 99 are the only references. Intermediate value theorem. That's why we learn real analysis, was to put uh, calculus on firm footing. Oh, I, I want to learn classical mechanics. I, I want to know how to get a Lagrangian, how to look at a thing and say, I know the Lagrangian of that. Do you? and then I can feel superior. Is abstract algebra a class taken by freshmen majoring in math? I think it's more commonly taken in a sophomore or even junior year.
I think that when I so when I was a freshman, I took the calculus sequence, linear algebra. I think I yeah the calculus sequence and linear algebra, and then I was on quarters. Quarters are dumb as fuck, uh, but I took quarters. I was on quarters, and then uh, in my sophomore year, in that first quarter, I took differential equations, which sucked. Um, and linear algebra sucked too. And, um, I think that's when I took that transition to higher maths course. And then I think after that is when I took the abstract algebra sequence. Oh uh, yeah, I think that's true. If there, it, it, so Vienna, if you're thinking about group theory, I think that what would be far more useful that, than calculus as far as like lower to it, I know you're young, I know this, but um, you probably haven't even done uh, calculus yet. But the, the, the other big brand, uh, thing in lower division mathematics is of course linear algebra. I would say that understanding linear algebra, oh, surprise, surprise, is more useful for something like abstract algebra than calculus would be. Yeah, I went to UC Davis as a child. I mean, as a, um, not child. I was a full grown adult. Um, I mean, not full grown. Did you know that your prefrontal cortex doesn't fully develop until like you're 23 on average? Oh, is it 25? Okay, my bad. I thought the number was 23. But yeah, UC Davis was on quarter systems. It still is. Kepler Hall. I'm not sure which one that is. I've forgotten a lot about the campus. I know there's there was Wellman, where I took a lot of my classes. There was Kerr Hall. Kerr? Kerr? Kerr Hall? There was Shield Library, of course. Absolutely stunning library. Um, golly, which other ones are there? I remember the music building because that's where my wife my wife studied music there so i remember the music building the coffee house of course the farmer's market yep i did i spend a lot of time as a library well as a graduate student so um, at Berkeley, we had a cool thing where we had a um, all the math books, all the math books were in a special library at the bottom of Evans Hall. Um, so the library was one elevator right away. I would say I didn't spend a whole lot of time in that library. Not a whole lot. I did spend some time because it was great. Great library, math library. And we had our own librarians and everything in there. Look, Evans is fine when you're on the inside, okay? And you don't have to look at it. Well, you're because you have this stunning views, okay? So Evans is godlike because you never, well, you do have to look at it when you're approaching it. But just never leave. Live in your office. Solution. You never have to look at the outside of Evans. It's great. No, there's not. I mean, maybe right now at this moment, but there's two. There's more. There's three in the main part, and there's uh, two over on the other side. You can't fool me.
And they've got the um, the awesome paintings on the seventh floor and eighth floor, I think. <laughs> we're oh, you know what you're trying. To Wait, how did this work again? I think the there's a bank of elevators which do not go down to the negative one or the zeroth floor. You have to go up one flight of stairs to get to the ba main bank and then you'll go up. Huh. Yeah, you got fucked. But um, yeah, the, the, <laughs> the, the set of three elevators don't go all the way down to the zeroth floor. Sorry, where the classrooms are? No, sorry. But the ones on the other side do. They go down to the zeroth floor. But yeah, it is kind of surprising that Evans Hall hasn't um, <laughs> been demolished. <laughs> yeah, because goddamn, it's a fucking eyesore. Could I show you some introductory proofs? Um, sure, but it's hard for me to know, like... Uh, Please don't prove that. Okay, yeah, I've done that before on stream, so I won't do that one. What is a good thing to prove? What about the sum of the binomial things? Uh... What is that? Um, yeah, I think induction is really cool. So I, I, I can't tell anymore. I'm so fucked up in the head. Does this look trivial or non-trivial? I mean, forget about it. So like, what do you think? Should we prove this? Square root of three is irrational. Sesquipedalianistic will hurt me though if I do that, so I can't do that one. Oh yeah, one plus one to the n. That's right. Oh, that's an even better way. If you know the binomial theorem. That also feels like cheating. But all of these also feel much harder or much easier than the um That thing, what is that thing? Induction. Wait, is that easy? So claim, is it even true? Claim, one cubed plus two cubed plus three cubed plus n cubed is equal to um, one plus two plus three plus n squared. Is that what you're saying? So we're gonna use a scheme a scheme called proof by induction and the way that you prove proof you the way that you prove statements using proof by induction particularly statements that involve the natural numbers like this is to first prove it when for, for some for some value of n so in this case we're going to prove it when n is equal to one so that's called the base case The claim is true, and I'm going to write something dangerous. It's obviously true if n is equal to 1. I think that's so. Right? Because if n is equal to 1, how many cubes do we have over here on this side, and what are they? Well, we just have 1 cubed. In other words, the left-hand side is equal to 1. And what is the right-hand side? It's uh, 1 squared. So all we're saying is that one cubed is equal to one squared. And that's why I say it's obviously true. Okay. I don't think anybody will ding you there. Now we prove the following magical thing. What it, what were the, toxic math nerds? That was the phrase. Toxic math nerds. That was the phrase. Okay. So anyway, we have the induction step now. So 
So what we have is what we, okay. What we want to work with, okay, is one cube plus two cubed. So there's, there's the first n term. So yeah, oh, I'm sorry. I need to back up. Assume the claim is true. Oh, and I should be a little careful here for n equal to k. So we're going to assume that the claim is true for n equal to k. And now what we're going to try to do, I should have written this in this line, but I messed up. So I hope you can bear with me here. Uh, we will let us show, let us, let us, let us show it is true for n equal to k plus 1. So let us show that it's true for n equal to k plus 1. So we know it's true, or we're going to assume that it's true for n equal to k. Let us show that it's true for n equal to k plus 1. Now, if we are able to show that it's true for n equal to k plus 1, then this claim, this inductive step in conjunction with the base case proves the claim for all n. This is magical, okay? You should think of it like it's like dominoes falling, okay? So here is a domino. This is the n equal to 1 domino. And we know the n equal to 1 domino is true by the base case. But And so we can imagine that domino toppling, right? Toppling over. Now, what about the n equal to 2 case? Well, because we've shown that if the claim is true for n equal to k, then it is true for k n equal to k plus 1, that will mean that, well, because it's true for n equal to 1, it must be true for n equal to 2. That, in other words, we can apply if true for n equal to k, then true for n equal to k plus 1, we can apply that to when k is 1. So that any, the n equal to 2 case of this statement will fall which will then, of course, cause the n equal to 3 case to fall, the n equal to 4 case to fall. In fact, all the dominoes, all the way down the line, will topple if we are able to show the induction step. And therefore, we will have shown that this equality holds for all possible values of n, for all integer values, all positive integer values of n. Okay, so we our job is to... Uh, prove that it's true for k plus 1. So, of course, this is what we know. The, or rather, this is what we know, that this is equal to 1 plus 2 plus all the way up to k squared. This is what we know. We know this. And now to get it to look like the k plus 1 case, what I'm going to do is add to both sides of this equation k plus 1 cubed. I hope this is the right thing to do. I have no idea if it is. So all I've done in going from here to here is added k plus 1 cubed to both sides. And now what we want to try to do is to show that this side is in fact 1 plus 2 plus all the way up to k plus 1 squared. Sure would be easier if I had a nice expression for 1 plus 2 plus dot 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 plus k, right? Like if I could rewrite that expression, this this expression right here, this would obviously be easier. I'm wondering if I have to resort to that. Okay, fair. Let's see, what, what does that do? Okay, so if we look at, so let's examine, instead of doing this, let's ex examine 1 plus 2 plus all the way up to k plus k plus 1, this whole thing squared. So 
what is this? I wonder if this does anything. So if this does A and this is B, then we know that A plus B squared is A squared plus 2AB plus B squared. This is equal to 1 plus all the way up to K squared plus 2 times 1 plus all the way up to K times K plus 1 plus K plus 1 squared. So then it sort of feels like what we're saying. is that this piece right here is k plus 1 cubed. So we can factor out a k plus 1. So let's see. I know. I just want to avoid it. I don't know why. I'm. I'm. Uh, okay. So, sure. Maybe. Maybe. All. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's do that. All right. Let's think about this now, shall we? So we have one, two, three, four, k. You see, that's k squares there. And then I'm going to take another copy. How many squares do we have here? We have 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus, oh, plus k. So this is, the number of squares here is the sum from 1 to k. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus k. Yeah? Now we're going to do that again. So how many red blocks are there? Again. One look, here's one. One plus two plus three plus four plus oh uh, yeah, k, k. Right. So this is two times one plus two plus all the way up to k. That's two times it. Now, what is the side length here, please? This side length is k. There are k squares on that side. And what's the side length up here? There are k plus 1 squares on that side. So now we are going to add one more horizontal row of squares. What are we adding on? We're adding on k plus 1 more squares. And what do we get after we do all that? What is this red, black, and green? Square, what is its dimensions rather? It's k plus 1 times k plus 1. All right. So this is equal to, oops, oops, what have, what have I done here? This is equal to, one plus all the way up to, um, so like this, one all, all the way up to k squared plus k plus 1 squared. Uh, k plus 1 cubed, excuse me. k plus 1 times k plus 1 squared. So then we've shown that this side here is equal to, well, this. And therefore we win by induction. Or sorry, therefore we've shown the inductive step. Because we'll... we'll this is very unorganized. Because what we've shown is that this quantity here, which by the way is right there, is equal to this, which is equal to that, which is equal to this right here. 
But this right here is this expression when n is equal to k plus 1. So we win. We've shown the inductive step, so all of the dominoes fall. The dominoes are close enough to one another that they'll all fall. They'll all fall. I don't know why I was so resistant to wanting to getting a sum here, but I was. Welcome. Guess who's online right now? And guess who we're raiding? Daydream Nation. Goo is godlike, though. Tunic. One, one of the best songs. The dad joke. Stop running. Go say hi to Boring Math Professor for me. I'm, I'm signing running. off tonight. I love you all so much. Oh! I would grade that, Tell him uh, about the manga guide to linear algebra. I think he'd really enjoy it. Um, hey, I love you all so much. That was a 4 out of 10. That's mine. I'm going to do this again tomorrow, okay? See you, see you, hope to see you on a future stream. I love you all. Bye. See ya. Okay. So on that note, I'm going to start grading people. That's what I